Andrew, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I was just saying before we started, I, I actually had the good fortune to read the book. I went half audio, half actually reading. I'm a much faster listener than I am reader. Uh, man, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, oh, this is this so is a topic, and I think when I reached out initially, um, I mentioned I've, I've always had uh, a very strong interest in longevity. Um, and one of the reasons being, I, I had the good fortune of meeting my one of my great grandfathers who lived mm-hmm. to be a hundred, and wow. uh, pra- yeah, which was really cool. And I mean, and, and honestly, you know, as I read through this book, he was one of those. Um, I'm going to butcher this word, but I think centenarians mm-hmm. who was really active. I mean, I think he gardened up until like the last year or two. I mean, I still remember him being hilarious. <laughs> so that was always a big motivator for me. Um, and so. When I saw your book, and I think I can't remember where I first found out about it, I was like, oh, I need to dive into this. Because one of the things that I thought was so interesting was the approach that you took. Um, there's so much information, so much noise, dare I say snake oil as well that's out yeah, there. Okay. I, I love the approach of like, hey, let me kind of explain what's going on here, assess where we are in the industry, and then hopefully help you kind of narrow down on like what is worth your time or or money. Mm-hmm. Um So yeah, fascinating. And maybe a great place to start too is um, where did your fascination with longevity begin? Do you know what? I've got a very numerical answer to that question because I I actually started out as a physicist. So I've got a very numerical sort of mathematical way of looking at the world. And I sometimes tell people slightly tongue in cheek, but honestly, only slightly that I changed career because of a graph. So I was actually at the end of my physics PhD before this stuff started to dawn on me. And I started reading a bit more about aging biology. And the graph that changed my life was this graph of your risk of death as a function of how old you are. And uh, what that shows you is that as you go through life, your risk of death doubles about every seven or eight years. And that means that it starts out relatively modest. So I'm in my 30s, my risk of death in any given year is about one in a thousand. But if you keep on doubling that, it starts out small, it doesn't get very big quickly at first. But eventually, Mm -hmm. by the time you're 80, your risk of death is about one in 20 every year. And if you're lucky enough to make it into your 90s, your risk of death every year is about one in six, that sort of life and death at the roll of a dice. (laughs) Now, as a human, you look at that and you're terrified because, you know, there's this exponential wall of death and suffering coming at you, you know, inexorably. But as a scientist, you look at that and you think, wow, why is it that our bodies fall apart on this, you know, right on schedule? Everybody's bodies start falling apart in their 70s or their 80s. Perhaps not centenarians, we'll come to that. But, Mm. you know, for most, the majority of people, we all start falling apart at about the same time. We all suddenly get frail. We all suddenly lose our eyesight, our hearing. We all become susceptible to this, you know, cancer, heart disease, dementia, this range of, you know, age-related diseases that all of us are so familiar with. And uh, the most likely things to kill you in the modern world. So, you know, as a scientist, you're looking at that graph and thinking, what is it? What's the biology that's causing this sudden and very synchronized increase in risk of death and all these other diseases? And most importantly, can we do something about it? And the more I read about aging biology, the more I realized the answer to that second question is yes, we can do something about it. And therefore, I just thought this is the single biggest, most important question in modern science. And so I decided to switch from being a physicist to being a computational biologist. And to cut a long story short, I spent about five years doing that. And I realized that actually even biologists don't fully acknowledge the importance of aging biology. So I decided to write a book about it. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Well, and maybe... um a great place to start for folks, right? What, what have you found to be the answer so far to that question? Why do we age? It's a whole variety of different things. So in the book, I talk yeah. about these 10 hallmarks of aging. And these are the sort of cellular, biological, molecular underpinnings of why does we age. And there are a whole range of different things, right? So that's starting at the very smallest scales. It's things like damage to the DNA, the instruction manual that's at the center of every mm-hmm. one of our cells. And if that instruction manual gets damaged, obviously, if there are typos in the manual, then you end up making, you know, that, that causes mistakes. It causes the cells to behave in aberrant ways. That is, yeah. that is sort of the main hallmark behind uh, the occurrence of cancer, because we know those are cells that have had DNA damage and go on to multiply you know far 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 too many times Mm-hmm. But there's loads of other stuff as well. There's malfunction of the proteins, so the individual molecular machines that you know basically do everything inside our bodies. There's malfunction of the mitochondria, these tiny little cellular power plants. And then sort of going up in scale, whole cells can become old. You can get something called a senescent cell, which is effectively an aged cell that stops doing whatever it's supposed to be doing in the body. And then you can look at the scale of whole systems. So you can have failures in the immune system, for example. And that's something mm. that's been really rammed home over the last sort of 12 or 18 months with the coronavirus pandemic, because we've seen that yeah. by far the biggest impact 
impact has been on the older population. And that's mm. basically because our immune systems get weaker as we get older. And, you know, because of because of the DNA damage, because of the senescent immune cells, because of a variety of other factors. So all of these things together just conspire to make us more susceptible to a whole range of, you know, things from frailty to disease. And yeah. so fundamentally, it's it's not, there's no simple answer to that question. But what's, right. um, what's really remarkable is these 10 hallmarks, um, you know, they, they might, some of them might sound a bit complicated. They, you know, they've got complicated biological names, but actually they're remarkably simple and there are yeah. remarkably few of them because if you think about how many age-related diseases there are there are hundreds of kinds of cancer maybe thousands depending on exactly how you break them down there are mm -hmm. loads and loads of different ways your circulatory system could go wrong you can have a stroke you can have a heart attack you can have you know different parts of your body can go wrong in different ways there are probably a few thousand age-related diseases and yet yeah. we think that it can be boiled down to these 10 fundamental processes and so the idea is that by intervening in those processes we can defer or maybe even prevent multiple age-related diseases at the same time Oh, that is interesting. Yeah. If we can identify kind of these 10 root causes, well, then that's 10 areas we can, we can focus. Exactly. Right? Uh, and, and granted there might be, you know, a number of like derivative use cases and symptoms that come off of that. But it's like, if we have like 10 places where we can focus our energy, there's, there's hope there. Definitely. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting, um, and this seemed like it was a needed shift in perspective, but not viewing age as something uh, that is just, you know, a, a reality that's unchangeable, um, but that it's actually a disease that can be treated. Could, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, actually. I'm, I'm someone who's a bit on the fence about whether or not we should call aging a disease. Oh, um, interesting. So, okay. So I, I know that a lot of people in the aging biology field, you know, trying to promote this and trying to really popularize the idea that aging is something we should treat. So, ah. you know, do call it a disease. The reason I'm a bit hesitant is because I don't really want to tell everyone, and I, I don't know where the cutoff would be, but over the age of 50 or over the age of 60, you're diseased. You know, there's something yeah. fundamentally wrong with you just because of how long ago you were born. Right. However... You know, on the flip side, it might be for various technical reasons that, that makes it easier for drugs for aging to be approved. So that's a sort of whole separate argument. So I'm sort of on the fence about whether we should actually call it a disease. Um, some biologists advocate calling it a disease syndrome. I don't think that sounds an awful lot better, mm. if I'm perfectly honest. Yeah, I don't um, feel better about that. But the point that. is that it predisposes us to all of these different diseases. And I think the, the best illustration of why aging isn't inevitable it's actually to look at the animal kingdom. The reason mm. there's uh, a turtle on the front cover of my book is because uh, various kinds of turtles and tortoises, uh, some things, salamanders, fishes, uh, and various other stranger creatures uh, display something called negligible senescence, which basically means mm -hmm. negligible aging. They don't, they don't grow old. Yeah. And so if we take the example of the Galapagos tortoise, which is uh, one of my favorites, and the, the, the anecdote with which I open the book, um, these are animals, they can live uh, to about 170, 180 years old, so they've got incredibly long lifespans. But mm -hmm. what's most incredible, actually, isn't how long they live, it's the fact that their risk of death doesn't change with age. So remember that humans' death uh, risk of death doubles every seven or eight years, as I said. But I thought that just, was fascinating. Yeah. yeah, it's just completely flat, and they don't get frail. You know, they're they're still sort of, I, I guess, waddling around quite slowly because they're tortoises. You know, they're not impaired in any way beyond their original slow pace. Uh, they seem to keep on reproducing until very late in life, so they, they just don't grow old in the way that we do. And what that yeah. really shows us is that aging isn't a law of biology. The, and the problem is that we age. You know, our friends, our family, our older relatives age, our pets age, our farm animals age. Most uh, most mammals, so the sort of animals that we tend to uh, interact with most commonly seem to display you know at least some degree of aging there's actually mm -hmm. one negligibly senescent mammal called the naked mole rat but park that one because that's a bit you know it's, it's a bit of a weird one most people don't have a pet naked mole rat right the right point is you know we look around and everything we see ages we even see machines you know things fall apart with time they go rust cars go rusty you know other stuff just breaks why mm -hmm. would uh, biological organisms be any different and actually the answer is we just hadn't really looked hard enough when we were coming to those conclusions if you look around the animal kingdom, kingdom there are plenty of different things that don't age and so the question is you know why do we have to do that yeah, that was one of the things. Um, I don't know may, may, if, if I knew this before I had forgotten, but I think there's like the anecdote of like the whale uh, who was who was caught and killed and it had like a spear in it that was dated back to like the mid 1800s. And so like that implied not only that it was around in the 19th century, but that at that time it was also already big enough to kind of bear the brunt of that attack, absorb it and yeah. continue. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, like so, so incredible to think about. Um, well, maybe another kind of great place to orient listeners is, can we talk about how age is defined? Because I think most often we think about age chronologically, um, but something that I've been really interested to learn more about uh, in the past few years is this idea of like biological age. Can, can, you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, and I, th I think this is actually something that most of us know intuitively and just haven't mm. really like joined the dots with. 
Yeah. Because we all know, you know if, we, if, if we look at older friends or relatives, there are some people who are 60 and they look absolutely great. They're just as you know fit and healthy as they were when they were 40, or at least, at least they look it. You know, they've, their, their hair's still there, whatever. These sort of external features, they're not wrinkly. They look great. Whereas there are yep. other people who are 60 and they, you know, they've got deep lines in their skin. They're losing their mobility. They're losing their hearing. They're losing their sight. They just seem much biologically older than, yep. um, you know, than, 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 than their people, than their friends who are looking younger. And actually... That, that does seem to be borne out. So there was a study, a fascinating one done in 2009, where uh, a, a panel was asked to rate the perceived age. Now, how old do you think this photograph of the person looks? And yeah. what they found was that the perceived age was able to predict that person's risk of death and predict their pers that person's risk of some diseases just oh, from wow. how old they look. And so hmm. what that really shows us is that, you know, what's happening on our faces, the wrinkles, the gray hair, the hair loss, whatever, these external signs, the really cool thing about the hallmarks of aging is they are the fundamental drivers, not just of the diseases, but also of these cosmetic external signs, you know, the things that we all associate with aging. Yeah. And that means that if you look at someone, you can literally see their biological age. Now, obviously that doesn't sound very sciencey. So we have managed to drill down and come up with some more sort of scientific sounding tests that can determine how <laughs> biologically old you are. I think the leading one at the moment is something called the epigenetic clock. So let's rewind a bit and explain uh, very briefly what epigenetics is. Yeah, please. Um, so our, our DNA is this, this instruction manual inside our cells, as I said. But what's really strange about it is that every cell in your body has the same two meter length of DNA. So that's whether it's a liver cell or a brain cell or a lung cell or an eye cell. They all have you know radically different functions. They do different stuff. They produce different proteins, but they've got the same instruction manual. So obviously mm. they're using different parts of that instruction manual. And so there are some genes, you know, say there's a gene for you know, that's only required in muscle cells. That means that gene is turned on in muscle cells and turned off in every other cell in the body just to make absolutely sure that, you know, that, that they don't start behaving a bit like a muscle cell. Yeah. And that regulation is done by something called epigenetics. It's basically a layer of various chemical changes that can happen to the DNA that turn mm. certain genes on and certain genes off in the right cells at the right times. And what's been found is that if you look at these epigenetic marks from people of different ages, you can actually construct this epigenetic clock. And uh, the, first, the first one that was made, was it was sort of 2012, 2013, this research really took off. And people looked at thousands and thousands of different samples from people of different ages. And they found that by looking at just 300 or 353 exactly of these, uh, of, of, of these epigenetic changes, they mm. could determine how old someone was from a sample of blood or a sample of skin or a sample of actually any tissue in the body, which is even more incredible, to within yeah. like three or four years years now that's not that amazing on one level because we already have a technology that can determine how old someone is to well better than three or four years which is a birth certificate however <laughs> what's more interesting is that if your epigenetic age is greater than your chronological age it means you're more right. likely to die you're more likely to get diseases you know you are as you, as you started as your question sort of implied biologically older than someone with a younger mm. epigenetic age yeah. and as we've got better at that we've improved epigenetic clocks so they're better predictors they can they can spot if you smoked or not for example so you, you can see that these things are accelerating the aging process and therefore how biologically old you are and what's most exciting is actually we've we've tried some interventions now and we can see that the epigenetic age is somewhat malleable so you can you know you can give someone a, a treatment and that can then slow down or reverse the increase of their epigenetic age so the idea is that we'd you know now we understand there's this thing called biological age the hope is that we can give someone a treatment that we think will slow down their aging and the way that we can tell is if it slows down the ticking of that epigenetic clock we hope that our treatment seems to have worked and and that's the thing i think that gets I mean, me excited, I'm sure most people excited, is this idea that it is malleable, that it can be changed. To, to what extent, and I guess it, it all depends on what we've measured so far, um, you know, can the biological age be reversed? Is it more of, hey, if we make these changes and these, these positive uh, adjustments in like your sleep, your nutrition, your exercise, we can kind of like slow it down? Or is there really the capability to be have your your biological age measured this year, measured a year from now after you've implemented all these changes and actually, you know, biologically look younger? It's a great question. I think in terms of the lifestyle interventions that you can make, you know, things like stopping smoking, eating well, exercise, all that kind of stuff, it probably just slows, uh, the, it sort of slows the trajectory. However, yeah. I don't think we've got really good experiments on this because these clocks were first developed only, you know, five or 10 years ago. Mm. It's not really possible for us to have done those nice long-term studies to watch and see how people's epigenetic ages change. And these things are ongoing. So there are these huge, what are called cohort studies, where they follow, you know, thousands and thousands of people who are born within the same year, for example, and watch, yeah. you know, what diseases they get and just basically they, you know they, they call them every year or every few years and measure loads of different things about them those studies are starting to look at the epigenetic clocks now so you know we're going to have results about this in in you know in, at, at some point in the not too distant future i think what really excites me is the fact that we've actually shown that some treatments um you know sort of medical interventions can reverse the epigenetic clock and the only one that's been shown in humans at the moment is um 
a trial to rejuvenate an organ called the thymus, which is an essential part of your immune system that declines in function with age, it actually declines very rapidly. I've already lost most of my thymus in my 30s. So you know, if you're in your 60s, or 70s or 80s, you've barely got any thymus left. And when and- you say you lost most of your thymus, do you mean just by nature of like your... <laughs> chronological age exactly like, just like okay yeah got yeah it. i haven't been doing anything to really hammer my thymus in my lifestyle yeah. at least as far as i'm aware <laughs> it's a very I was like, well, just that you know what my 20s were really hard yeah i just, <laughs> I just put a lot of miles on my thymus <laughs> <laughs> exactly no it's a it's a strange thing this this, this organ is really really active it's a, it peaks in size when you're aged one and i think hmm. every 15 years it halves in size it's something like that so it's, it's an incredibly rapid exponential decay and it's basically all been replaced by fat by the time you're in your 60s there's a tiny tiny fraction of it left mm-hmm. um yeah, so this trial used a variety of drugs and hormones to try and rejuvenate the thymus and sort of grow, grow it back a little bit. And what was most interesting about that trial was, you know, firstly, the thymus did grow back a little bit. That's good. Secondly, the T cells, the type of immune cell that the thymus produces, did go up in number a little bit, at least the sort of fresh, newly created ones. But the more exciting thing was that they observed that the trial participants' epigenetic age was actually reversed slightly, hmm. which suggests, I mean, it, it's sort of unsurprising in a way because the immune system has so many diverse uh, effects throughout the body. Then, you know, it's quite conceivable that it could try and do a bit of age reversal so the hope is that's a very sort of tentative early trial it's probably not the most efficient way to uh, to rejuvenate the thymus it's just an easy way to do it you know with with drugs and hormones that are already regulated for use in humans so it's a sort of first step the question is as we get these more effective therapies will we be able to turn back that clock a little bit more so i guess we'll just have to wait and see yeah and one of the things that that was interesting as i went through this is there's um you know, to anyone who follows the news, it's like every six months or so, maybe even a little more often, some new anti-aging breakthrough pops up. It's stem cells, it's um, NAD plus, there was a lot of buzz about like Mm. all of these things. And it's like, oh, wow, like this is ready now. In in your estimation, um, with a lot of these things that people are experimenting with, like, are we at a place where there's any um, actual tangible approaches that people can start taking? Or are we still in like very early innings of trying to understand how this impacts the human body? I don't think there's anything solid that you can do today apart from sort of the standard health advice. And yeah. well, I hesitate to call it sort of standard or sometimes I call it boring health advice. Because actually <laughs> what, I've, what I've found is that there's a chapter of this stuff in the book. And I actually got quite excited about you know, things like you know, eating the right diet and exercise. Because when you understand the aging biology, you find out these yeah. things really are you know, fundamentally slowing down the aging process. So that's, that's mm. really quite cool. However, I think in terms of treatments, we're not far from being able to say what works and what doesn't. But a lot of these things, it's a little bit too early to tell. I think it'll, it'll literally be a handful of years before we get the first results. So there's um, some drugs called senolytics, which kill these aged senescent cells I talked about. They work hmm. in mice. We've got human trials ongoing. The first trial started in 2018. I think there are about 20 or 30 companies currently trying to you know, turn those from the lab into the clinic into you know, practical, applicable treatments. So that's exciting. Um, but actually, and there's also a drug called metformin, which is a, a diabetes drug. Yeah. Um, which has some hints that it's going to slow down the aging process more broadly and not just affect diabetes. Um, that sh- the clinical trial actually, I think, should have started already, but was delayed due to COVID. So, you know, in three or four oh. or five years, we're going to know the answer to that. Um, and metformin is a you know, cheapest chips over the counter, not over the counter, sorry, but prescription diabetes drug. So it's the sort of thing where I, th- I think it's literally pence per tablet or cents per tablet if you're a. Yeah, if you're broadly accessible if you have <laughs> diabetes. Exactly. So, like, it's it, this is the sort of drug where if it can be shown that it slows down the aging process, it could only be a few years before we all, where, you know, everyone over the age of X, whatever that is defined to be, is going to start taking it. So I don't think there's anything you can do literally right now, but there's so much excitement, so much buzz, and so many things being developed that I don't think it's going to be long before we are in that situation. For some of these things that currently are on the market, like, you know, th- there's a lot of companies of interest, right, who, who are playing in this space. One that's notable is Elysium, and it has a lot of incredible academics associated with it working for the company. Um, you know, for, for people who say, hey, look, there's some of this stuff on the market. It's really interesting. I understand there's some risk, but to me, it seems like a risk worth taking. And that risk profile is different for everyone, right? A young, healthy person's risk is much different than someone who might have a critical illness already and has a lot of concern Mm. about their own estimated longevity. Um, What are the sort of risks that people should be taking into consideration when um, thinking about trying some of these treatments that are still really cutting edge, not a lot of data behind uh, and relatively new? This does really fascinate me, actually. It's something that I've thought about a lot myself because we're at a stage now where I'm, as I say, thankfully in my 30s and I feel like my risk profile is such that I'm happy to wait. You know, if it takes five years to find out about metformin, I probably wouldn't be thinking about taking metformin until I'm in my 40s or 50s anyway. So I'll probably Mm. know the answer by the time I'm going to start taking it. Um, And a lot of the other stuff, it's more risky, but then equally, you know, if I was already 70, 
then you know w- would i be thinking about this I, I really don't know how i'd approach that problem um and yeah, the, cha- it, the challenge is 70 or 80 right you don't have the benefit of time yeah you can't just just hang around for these things wait to to 10 to 15 years to i think yet. i think for most of us you know we're going to have results from these first few first few drugs in you know five or ten years so unless mm-hmm. you're already you know old or very worried about your health you're probably better off just just waiting and as mm-hmm. you know as, a, as an although i'm a doctor i'm a physics doctor you know, i'm not my, my wife is the other kind of doctor and would obviously try and you know jump in she'd be uh, leaping through the door here if i try and have <laughs> any medical advice i just I just think it's really really challenging because the, what you really want to do is have a, a randomized controlled trial in humans so you want to have a mm. trial where you get a bunch of people who are you know and this is actually the design for tame which is the trial that's going to be worked uh, going to be tri- tried for metformin you have oh. you know they've got three thousand people they're going to have 1500 people taking actual metformin 1500 people taking a placebo so effectively a sugar pill that doesn't have any active ingredient in it and um what they do is they watch that they're all going to be over the age i think of 60 probably between the ages of 60 and 79 something oh, okay. like that and they just watch them for five years and they see who gets diseases first, who gets, you know, who dies first. And by looking at those results, if, if you get more people getting diseases later in the metformin group compared to the placebo group, then it looks like metformin works. And mm. you can also look at the side effects. Now, actually, for metformin, that's a bit of a funny one because we've been prescribing this in the UK since the 50s. So you've got a pretty long history of knowing that it doesn't right. have, we, we, we know that it's got some side effects in terms of the digestive system. But as long as those don't crop up in your case, you know, that they're, they're relatively mild. They go away if you stop taking it. There's no permanent damage done. So we know it's a pretty safe drug. But the problem with some of these more experimental anti-aging drugs is that we, you know, we tried them in mice. Let's take senolytics as an example, because that's something you, mm-hmm. know, you might think about. We've got really solid results in mice that show they, they basically make mice biologically younger. If you give a, a 24-month-old mouse, that's 70 in human years, because mice obviously have a shorter lifespan than us. If you give a 24-month-old mouse a dose of these senolytics, they live yeah. a couple of months longer, which is maybe a few years in human terms. They, um, they, 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 they're at less risk of disease. They get less cancer, less heart disease. Uh, they're, they're more curious. So it seems to sort of slow their brain aging um hmm. they can run further and faster on a little mousy treadmill they even have better fur so there's this sort of they, they just look great these animals and so it's really yeah. showing us that removing these aged cells has this global effect on the, the mouse's biology so that's really exciting and um you know if you look at the papers that, that report these results there don't seem to be any side effects Hmm. which, um, you know, on the one hand, it's really optimistic. On the other hand, you have to sort of think about what this means. If you're a scientist and you're trying to get your, you know, your, your publication in Nature, which is one of the biggest journals in, the, you know, in science, you want yeah. to be, um, you, you want to prevent your work, present your work, sorry, as absolutely beautiful and perfect. You've got all these mice, they're living longer, they're healthier, blah, blah, blah. And they don't, you know, there's nothing else wrong with them. So you're, you're tempted to sort of, you know, if one of the mice did look a bit weird or had a bit of a strange result, you're tempted to sort of exclude that one for some spurious reason, mm. or for perhaps spurious reason. Um, and similarly, you can't ask mice, you know, how they're feeling. If they're getting headaches from these drugs, uh, you know, that's, they're getting intolerable headaches. They aren't going to tell the experimenters that maybe their behavior would change in such a way as we could pick it up. But they might have some problem that would only be picked up when we try these things in humans. So right. it's really, really tricky to know like would i would you you know would i or or should you take that gamble um and at the end of the day i I think it's just really really difficult to because you know we know we know that so many drugs fail to make the transition from mice to humans (sighs) but it's it's just going to be really really challenging and at some point we're going to all get to the stage where we're old enough and there are some experimental treatments that you know perhaps there'll be a new generation of senolytics available when I'm 50. And, you know, yeah. I'll have the results from the previous generation. I'll have seen the new generation in mice. Should I take the new generation? It's, it's, it's going to be a very, very difficult decision. And I think actually one of the things I talk about in the last chapter of the book is how I think doctors and scientists and regulators are going to have to try and help people make these decisions. Because, you know, I've I've written this whole book. I spent two years researching it. And even I don't feel in a position where I'm, you know, fully confident suggesting things you know doing things myself one way or the other luckily i'm young enough that i can afford to wait and see yeah but that was a very long and very inconclusive answer because it is tough man it's really really tough no and i but i think that's what's so important too because at face value even if you took the time to read these research papers um, or these studies right the results might look really conclusive but mm-hmm. i think one of the things that you did a really good job in this book is um kind of raising awareness of all the other factors that go into these tests. Like, yes, it was done on mice, but those, it might've been like mice with a very specific genetic profile. Mm. Um, right. So it doesn't res- represent a diverse population genetically. So, mm. you know, when you go to transfer that to people who are incredibly diverse, like what are all the sorts of unintended consequences that could come from doing gene editing or, uh, you know, all of these various approaches that you list in here. So I was like, Oh wow, that's really eye opening. It's, it's not enough just for there to be positive results there's so many deeper layers of um, testing that need to be done to confirm that something like this is safe for a broader population of people, Definitely. which 
which I think is important to remember when you when you see some of these solutions that are on the market today. Because I get excited about it too. And I'm like, oh man, and look at some of the people behind this. This looks so exciting. It's like, well, what is the consequence of making that change in your body? And how does that play out over time? Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it to you. Like, are, are you doing anything uh, today in terms of trying to improve longevity behind, like you said, some of those boring health recommendations? There's a fantastic saying in medicine. Um, Don't just do something, stand there. And it sort of shows you this, this you know, inaction and action are to some extent um interchangeable and i think people mm. think that you know I, i'm aging i'm getting older every single day i should do something about it you know i should go out and take this latest supplement or whatever it is but yeah. actually there's quite a lot to be said from you know our bodies are exquisitely evolved we can survive for you know 50 60 70 years without any significant impairment so i'm relatively happy to leave that to its own devices in terms mm. of stuff that i do it's it's honestly not very much um I was taking vitamin D until recently because of the sort of suspicion it might do something related to COVID actually, rather than for any longevity oh, reason. Right. Yeah. But as, as the more research has come in, in fact, in the last few weeks, there was a paper published that basically said it doesn't, doesn't seem to make any uh, difference because the people who had low vitamin D, actually, if you correct for all the other things that are wrong with them, having a low vitamin D level and then performing, you know, uh, doing badly with COVID, it's just a marker of other things that are wrong with you, which we right. know predispose you to bad results with COVID. The reason I was happy to do that, and this is, this is a strange thing, I thought it probably wouldn't work. So, you know, the evidence was suggestive, but it was far from conclusive. There's never been a randomized controlled trial, which, like I said, is the sort of perfect test. But yeah. there was suggestive evidence. If you look at the best, uh, what are called systematic reviews, which is the what scientists do when they draw together all of the results from, you know, in a given particular intervention, all the different trials, they throw out the weak ones, they keep the strong ones, they combine them statistically to get you the most robust results. It shows right. that vitamin D, drum roll please, has zero effect on your lifespan. It has no effect on what's called all cause mortality. So all, you know, it has no effect on all the different ways you can die. Um, so mm. I was fairly confident taking that because I thought there was an outside chance it might help with COVID. Um, I, but there was no chance that it would affect my lifespan in a significant way, either up or down. So it was a strange yeah. sort of risk benefit calculation. Um, and as I say, since that sort of evidence has come in on COVID and actually since you know, the sun's shining at least a little bit occasionally now here in the UK, it's not as important to be getting a vitamin D supplement. So I haven't bothered with that for the last few days or weeks. Yeah. Um, other than that, no, I try and eat, get a you know, good diet. I try and eat lots of vegetables. I try you know, trying to cut down my meat consumption a bit because I think that's very good both for your body and for the environment. It's good for your microbiome. It's just you know, better across the board. Trying to get some exercise, trying to make sure I do some strength training, which is particularly challenging at the moment because the gyms are shut. But oh, um, yeah. that's something that, uh, you know, having... Um, ha having written this book, basically, I've decided that strength training is, is much more important than people commonly give it credit for, mm -hmm. because this age-related loss of muscle mass, uh, we lose about 5% of our muscle mass and 10% of our strength every decade after the age of 30. But yeah. actually, an awful lot of that is reversible just by, you know, it's basically because we don't use our muscles enough that, 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 that they start to atrophy. It's obviously not completely reversible. You can't stop yourself aging, but it yeah. seems to be pretty important. And having stronger muscles in older age... Um, can you know stop you doing things like falling over and having a fall when you're older can be a really really serious thing that can land you in hospital and can radically shorten your lifespan overall right so basically I, you know i think that's something that's important that's really been highlighted to me i've also um in the health advice chapter tried to highlight some a handful of less conventional bits of advice which mm. um understanding a bit more aging biology uh shows to you and i've i've become much more fastidious about brushing my teeth the reason being that it looks yes, as though that one brushing, that one was very eye-opening it really uh, is yeah. But you, you would not expect that to have anything to do with the aging process. But back in the 90s, scientists started doing these studies that showed that people who had better oral hygiene tended to have better heart health. And at first, you know, the sort of suspicion was this is a case where correlation doesn't equal causation, which is a classic problem with observational studies where you're just watching people. Because maybe mm -hmm. the people who brush their teeth uh, more thoroughly, maybe they're just health nuts. You know, maybe they're really concerned about their health overall. They're eating better, they're getting more exercise. And they're also, you know, not coincidentally spending more time on their mouths as well. However, mm -hmm. as the evidence has come in, as you've been a bit more able to drag out the causality there, it seems that um, there is a connection. And that connection is probably this process called chronic inflammation, which is one of these ideas that's behind a, a huge range of different parts of the aging disease. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that. I would love to talk more about this. So that's the idea that as you get older, so inflammation is a really important process, right? So it's the process by which your body heals wounds. It's the process by which you, you know, fight off diseases. And as long as it's acute, so it's sort of short and sharp and disappears as soon as the problem that it's trying to solve is gone, that's a great mm -hmm. thing. It's really important. It keeps you safe, keeps you healthy. However, right. as you get older, your whole immune system starts to become kind of non-specifically paranoid all the time, just at a very low level. And that can basically accelerate the whole aging process. Mm. And so imagine that you've got uh, poor oral health, you know, you've got gum disease, you've got tooth decay. These are infections in your mouth, they're bacteria in your mouth. And 
as you know from the fact you know the fact your dentist has to drill your teeth out is because um these infections are never quite got rid of the bacteria just carry on you know slowly but surely in this war of attrition with your immune system where neither side really ever you know scores a victory and that mm in effect is inflammation you know, it's, it's your it's your immune system responding to a threat but it's not this acute inflammation it's constant it is chronic and so we think that those inflammatory molecules can affect your heart so they can make you more likely to have heart disease or even a heart attack and actually there's even some emerging evidence that the bacteria that are found in gum disease are sometimes found in the brains of people with dementia now that's a bit of a weird one because it could be that maybe the bacteria are taking advantage of the fact that the brain's basically in a state and so they sneak in there and you know that's yeah. that's how they end up there so the co the causation is the other way around it could be the dementia is allowing the bacteria in or it could be that those bacteria are somehow involved or accelerating the process. So either way, I'm willing to sort of you know take the cautious approach here and make sure my teeth are extra clean in order to hope you know obviously avoid dental bills, but hopefully uh, slow down my aging at the same time. Yeah, that that's the one. Well, and and this is actually a topic I would love to talk to you about too. Is I'm I'm certainly interested in longevity, but I think living long just for living longer's sake is not necessarily appealing, right? And I think a lot of folks can relate to seeing a loved one who in like the latter 10 years of their life lived in poor health and you know it, it didn't look like something they're like i'd give up the last 10 to enjoy you know the first yeah. 60 70 more um and so one of the things that i thought was again a great change of perspective is this idea of not just focusing on longevity but on on health span mm -hmm. um would you mind explaining a little bit you know what health span is and, and what you mean by that yeah, the idea is that rather than focusing on lifespan, we focus on health span, which yeah. is the portion of your life during which you're healthy. And obviously, it's a bit of a fuzzy decision, uh, sort of dis uh, definition. It's not as though you instantly cease to be healthy as soon as you have one ache or pain. But you can, you know, do these surveys and ask people how long do you, you know, are you able to get around the house and do your everyday tasks without impairment? You know, are you in pain every day? And questions right. like this. And what you what you can see is that you know. This is this is a malleable thing as well, right? And you know, one way you can see it is because people who are in uh, people who are in poorer parts of countries tend to have worse health spans. In the US and the UK, there are you know pockets of poverty in you know in our cities and various other places where people don't just live a shorter life. They also live a less healthy life. So they have a shorter lifespan and a shorter health span. Yeah. And actually centenarians are a wonderful counterpoint. So people who make it to 100, they're often healthy exactly as your great granddad was right until mm. the end. You know, the average person who lives to, to over the age of 100 is actually independent until the age of 100, which is incredible because you know most people are in, in a nursing home in their 80s or 90s. Whereas yeah. you know, these people, not only do they get to live longer, they get to live less of their life in ill health. So it's just a fantastic deal. And what that shows us is that, you know, fundamentally human health span isn't a fixed quantity either. And so mm. we should really be, you know, seeking obviously to improve health span over lifespan. And actually I, I think that if lifespan, we, sh we should look at lifespan increases as more of a side effect of health span increases. Because the fact is that if you're healthy, if you haven't got a disease, diseases are what kill you. So if we can put off right. those diseases till later, you will live longer, but more importantly, you'll live healthier for longer. And that's the thing that we really need to target. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that's encouraging too. Um, you know, what I, I've talked about this in the past, but now my goals have shifted. You know, hey, look, I'm I'm in my mid thirties. I'm thirty four. I'll be thirty five at some point in the near future. Um, but it's like you know, I'm encouraged when I see the sixty year old who's incredibly active, the seven year old, seventy year old who's out there. Uh, you know. Um, paddle boarding or you know it's like there, there's now enough examples of people who are doing really active incredible things very late into life and it's like okay how do i position myself to do that and so not just this focus on living longer but hey what are things that i can do like you said strength training um you know our, our i think you said our muscle mass decreases uh, every decade after 30 but that can actually be reversed through strength training so mm -hmm. those are the sorts of things to me that that were really encouraging um and so are, are there any other kind of examples like the strength training, things that the average person could be doing that they might not be doing uh, that can help increase health span? It's a good question. I, I actually think the main thing is to try and do whatever it is you're aiming to do in manageable amounts uh, and, and, to, and not to be scared about when you start. So to give two examples, um, yeah. in terms of the manageable amounts thing, it's the, the worst thing is to be sedentary. And so if you have a sedentary life, you know, if you've got a desk job, like obviously a lot of us have, particularly yeah. during the pandemic, um, even taking a 10 minute walk a day, you know, a moderate pace, you don't have to be running for 45 minutes a day. Even that first 10 minute walk is going to dramatically improve your health and your lifespan. Mm -hmm. And what can then happen is, you know, maybe that'll build you up so you can do a 20 minute walk or you can walk a bit more briskly, or you could maybe think about trying to have a, a short run and slowly but surely you can build up. So, you know, don't be intimidated by, you know, that you have to be doing 10Ks as soon as you get off, you know, straight off the bat. 
building up to these things slowly is really, really worthwhile. And it's the same with dietary changes. You don't have to you know, rip everything up and go on a massive diet and change everything overnight. You can yeah. do these things you know, step by step, try and replace an unhealthy thing with a healthy thing and you know, slowly move on that way. And the second thing I think is just, you can start, it's never too late to start, I should say. Obviously earlier is better, but there's um, the, the only cliche my editors let me sneak into the book was the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is today. And I, I love that, that one, yeah. Really, really rings true <laughs> in terms of health advice because um, actually to talk about the strength training again, a fantastic study I found did some strength training in 90 year olds or 90 somethings in fact. Yeah. And they gave these people, I think it was a, a month or two month course of strength training. And over that course, they found that they, they could walk faster, they could lift more, you know, their, their muscle strength improved, their fitness improved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if you can do that at the age of 90, then you can definitely do it at the age of 30 or 40 or 50, even if, you know, you've had, a, <laughs> you've lived the worst possible life so far, there is still hope. And all of these things, they're cumulative. So all these age related changes, you know, as, as soon as you start, you will see an improvement and it will go on to improve your life and health span. So quitting smoking, for example, I think if you quit before your thirties, it basically has no effect on your lifespan as far as we can tell. Which start, is incredible. Which is yeah. amazing, you know, because obviously smoking is the single worst thing you can do for your mm -hmm. body from a biological perspective. So it's really amazing that, you know, if you, if you quit soon enough, you can basically remove that effect. And so, you know, however old you are, make those first few small steps and just get going with it. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the, uh, the topics that I, that I appreciated, um, was this idea of like longevity escape velocity. Mm -hmm. Um, we've kind of already talked about it a little bit like, Hey, look, if you're of a certain age, like it kind of benefits you to wait until, can, can you talk about the sort of things that might be coming down the pike in the next 10, 20, 50 years that if you can just kind of hang around might be coming down the pike that, that you will be able to take advantage of once we know more? That's actually the other thing that really excites me about this little boring health advice is that yeah. um, the longer you can live in good health, the more years you give scientists to develop these treatments, which you can then mm. hopefully benefit from. Um, and the idea of longevity escape velocity is the idea that at the moment, life expectancy is going up by about three months a year. So every year you live, you gain about three months on the end of your lifespan, Oh, which is great. But what would be even better would be if every year you lived, uh, you're gaining a year on your lifespan. And what that ultimately means is that you're moving forward through life, but your funeral is receding into the future as fast or hopefully even faster than you're chasing it, which means, you know, hopefully right. it'll be a very, very long time until you get there. So how can we go from the current sort of modest, but very, very consistent, actually, it's been doing that for the last sort of 200 years. How can we hmm get from that modest increase in lifespan to this longevity escape velocity? Well, the answer is we need to just develop these anti-aging therapies quickly enough. And, you know, I don't think I or anybody else can safely predict whether this is going to happen in our lifetime or our children's lifetime. I'd be astonished if I came back in, I don't know, the year 2500 and we haven't sorted this problem out. But the question yeah. is, you know, is it, how soon is it going to happen? And the sort of, uh, the, the, the simultaneously question dodging and yet exciting answer that I give to this is it's going to happen in time for most people alive today, not necessarily longevity escape velocity, but these treatments. The yeah. reason being, as I said, metformin, we're going to know about in the next three to five years, and we could literally roll it out tomorrow if it turned out to have an anti-aging effect, because it's very, very cheap. It's got a good safety profile. It's already approved in humans, you know, no obstacles at all. Yeah, so it's like, like this, I've been taking it over 50 years. Exactly. Yeah. Something like senolytics, the way that they're probably going to work, these first trials are for specific indications. And by indications, I basically mean diseases. So there are things like lung fibrosis or knee arthritis or various forms of age-related blindness, which we know senescent cells are heavily implicated in. And so the idea mm. is that if we can give these senolytics, we can potentially um, slow down or reverse the trajectory of these diseases. And the reason that they're targeting specific diseases is because you currently can't get a drug approved just for aging. So you, to, you know, give it to what we would currently call a healthy 60-year-old. Old. They're not healthy in the sense that they've biologically aged, but they are healthy in the eyes of the medical system. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can't give those drugs, we can't give drugs to those people. Yeah. So um, the idea actually of this metformin trial isn't necessarily because metformin is going to be a blockbuster and make us all live 20 years longer. It's probably going to be a much less significant effect than that. But the yeah. idea is that by proving the principle that you can use a drug against aging broadly, it'll then smooth the way for future drugs. So let's think about those analytics. You know, say they get approved for a particular disease in the next five years. If mm -hmm. they're effective, but most importantly, if they're safe, and therefore, you know, they don't have huge side effects. We could think about giving them to people who are basically healthy. You'll see them being prescribed to people who've got less severe diseases. And slowly but surely, we might get to a point where we're confident to hand those out to, you know, people who are just quote unquote old. Um, yeah. And so that then it's a sort of preventative medicine to try and stop them getting ill in the first place, to try and defer that cancer, defer that heart disease by getting rid of these aged cells. So that could easily happen in the next 10 years, as long as there are no significant headwinds. 
And yeah, then there's the, the more sort of out there stuff. And I say more out there. This isn't sort of completely wild, you know, hundreds of years into the future, but the stuff that sounds a bit more futuristic. And that's things like gene editing or stem cell therapy, for example. Mm -hmm. And these things, the reason I say they're not completely wild is we've already got approved gene therapy and stem cell therapy treatments. In fact, stem cell therapy, um, although it sounds kind of cool and futuristic, we've actually been doing that for about 50 years or even more because we've been doing bone marrow transplants, which are actually a right. form of stem cell therapy. However, we're getting much, much more skilled at manipulating stem cells, at generating stem cells from the cells of your own body and that kind of thing. And we've got trials ongoing for things like... Um, Parkinson's disease, things like age-related macular degeneration, which is a form of blindness. These are happening yeah. now. Yeah. And they aren't necessarily going to be rolling these things out in the clinic in the next five years, but perhaps, you know, five, ten, it's, it's, it's decades away rather than centuries. And that means, you know, if you're not too old now, if you can benefit from some of these, uh, you know, something like metformin, something like senolytics, you could well be alive in time for the first stem and gene cell, uh, stem cell and gene therapies, I should say. Right. It's like if you can just kind of incrementally keep eking out more years and keep pushing out the, you know, I can't remember how you worded it, but just that lifespan and hang around until some of these bigger improvements come exactly. into play. It's like then you have a shot at really making a, a substantial change. And what really uh, intrigued me was the very last science chapter of the book, I start talking about reprogramming aging. So the idea yeah. that we could go in and we could edit our genes in an intelligent way. We could sort of understand the biological mechanisms. We could start giving ourselves new genes. We could give ourselves genes that would um, you know, respond to particular stimuli in particular ways. The same way that our genes currently work, but we could engineer those genes in order to try and slow our aging down. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that we're going to do that probably is to build these enormous what are called systems biology models of humans. So we're going to have mm. to have huge computer models. There are going to be enormous quantities of data, probably involve some kind of machine learning because that's you know that's really proving its uh, proving its worth in terms of analyzing huge data sets in terms of making predictions from those data sets. Yeah, these are massive computer models, right? And as I was writing this, I was thinking this you know stem cell therapy or gene therapy maybe they're not sci-fi but this is mad right you know what, what are you writing here about this enormous you know huge artificial intelligence model of, of human uh you know right. the whole of human biology but then i, I thought, think there's a dan brown book that <laughs> did the same thing to like model the uh creation of the universe and whatever but exactly so you know if, it does it, feel it, very it feels sci -fi. like the topic of a sci-fi novel but then i thought actually you know this this stuff isn't so crazy. Let's let's imagine fifty years in the future. Well, actually, let's go back and imagine fifty years in the past. So, fifty mm -hmm. years ago, computers were you know millions, maybe billions. I'm not actually sure the number of times slower than they are now. You know, you've oh, got yeah. more power in your phone in your pocket by some distance than the computers that got the Apollo missions to the moon. I know. So you know, we just got <laughs> incredible, so incredible advances in processing power in terms of storage. If you think about um, the data revolution in biology, the other side of it is, of course, generating that data. Hmm. The Human Genome Project, uh, finished in 2001, did the first complete map of a basically a single person. It wasn't quite a single person. It was a few people spliced together. But effectively, you know, the whole human genetic code. That cost billions of dollars. It took about probably 10 years or so, depending on where you define the start and the finish. Now we can sequence your whole genome in an afternoon for less than $1,000. So the, you know, the rate of like technological advancement. I mean, just look, you know, we talked a little bit about COVID. Um, you know, when we first started really getting serious about it in probably March, everyone's like, how long is it going to take to come up with a vaccine? Like this mm -hmm. usually takes years and, it and I'm sure a lot of that is bureaucracy, um, and procedural, but it was just like, what, five, six companies came up with a, an effective vaccine and started trials within less than a year. Like, it's just, it's incredible. unbelievable when you put the resources and the technology behind it how quickly we're starting to make these advancements. Exactly. And I think COVID is just a really beautiful example. I, exactly as you say, you know, if, if, if the bureaucracy is behind you, if the funding is there, science can make these incredible uh, sort of leaps forward. And I yeah. think if we just had that sort of, even, even a fraction of that resolve and put it against aging biology, we could understand the aging process. We could start to develop these first treatments. And so to return to the sort of sci-fi, that I mean, mRNA vaccines, they, they were sci-fi a year ago. They're these right. in incredible technology. You can send a little parcel of genetic code into your cells and it can start building its own viral proteins and make you immune. Absolutely mind-blowing. But if we're going to go like all the way to these sort of AI models of whole humans, yep, let's you, go might, there. <laughs> you might think that's crazy. And I certainly thought that was crazy as I started writing it. But then you're like, actually, you know, I wouldn't bet against that happening in 50 years. I'm not saying it's going to. I'm not saying the models will be perfect, but I right. wouldn't bet against us having pretty good, you know, at first attempts, first drafts of a system biology model of humans. And what that means is that, you know, I'm, I'm 35 now, so yeah. I can easily expect to live to 85, even in the absence of any medical technology, you know, and any substantial shifts in medical technology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I've therefore got senolytics, I've got 
uh, you know, I've got metformin, I've got whatever the, the drugs are that come after those things. Maybe I'll have some basic early gene editing to try and improve my cholesterol or something like that. I could easily imagine that I'm going to live to 90 or 95. I mean, actually, that would be possible if I get lucky without any uh, changes in medical technology. And that yeah. then means I'll be alive at a time to benefit from what could be the first tentative steps in systems biology. And then, you know, I'm not saying that we're all going to live vastly, vastly longer than our projected lifespans. Maybe we'll get unlucky and nothing will work. And, you know, we'll, we'll just end up with a treatment that adds a few years that's developed in the 2040s and that's it. And you know, nothing happens until the next century. But it would be, I think, a foolish scientist who bet against this stuff happening easily in time for a huge, huge number of people who are alive today. And yeah. this concept of you know, living long enough to live even longer. That's what I call the health advice chapter in the book. I think that's just so, so important because, you know, when I talk about a cure for aging, I, I like to do that. It uh, raises a bit of chagrin amongst some scientists. But when you're talking about a cure, you're not thinking about a single pill that you're, you know, we're suddenly going to develop. It's going to be 2035. We're going to develop this pill that suddenly stops aging, just pop it once a day and, you know, magic. What's going to happen is it's going to be the succession of developments. We might mm. not even realize we've cured aging when we have because, you know, we're I just, we're enjoyed, time. yeah, I enjoyed that, that thought. It's like, oh, we might not even realize that we've gotten to a point where we just keep pushing it out. Exactly. Because, you, you know, you'll be thinking, will the next discovery ever come? And then it will. And then it will again. It will again. And until, you know, perhaps with hindsight, people in the year 3000 will look back and go, oh, aging was cured in, you know, 2085 or aging was cured in 2212. But I think at the time, it's not going to be obvious when that happens because it's just going to be this slow succession of treatments. But, you know, if we put in the funding, if we put in the effort, if we recognize that aging is this problem and it is something that we can solve, I think, you know, at the, at the very least, we can accelerate this so it happens, even if it happens 10 years sooner, we'll save millions and millions of lives. Yeah. When you talk to experts in the field, um, are any of them willing to give an estimate of what they think the potential human lifespan could actually be? I mean, are there those who think like, hey, we could get this dialed into a point Maybe this is kind of what we're talking about, where like technically you could be biologically immortal or are they like, hey, we think if we really get everything dialed in, the human body can make it 150 years, 200 years. Like what are the, the kind of like wide swath of estimates look like? I think actually um, sometimes scientists really talk past each other when they're trying to discuss this. My personal opinion is that with theoretically perfect um, you know, abilities to alter our biology. There is no reason that we couldn't be ageless. We couldn't end up like a tortoise mm. with a risk of death that doesn't vary depending on how long ago we were born. And how right. long we'd live in that scenario is basically determined by your background risk of death. Um, uh, and, you know, that's going to be things like car accidents, it's going to be things like infections that can, you know, they can still kill a 30 year old. And it's yeah. going to be the fact that even if you're 30, you can get cancer, you can get heart disease. These things are much, much more unusual in younger people, but it's not like they're right. unheard of. It's not like you're just going to stop dying. However, um, when you ask scientists about this, it depends on the field of science they're in. Um, some of them who are more sort of demographers, so people who are looking at you know, human populations. The oldest person ever to have lived, we think, is a, a woman called Jeanne Carmont. She was a French woman who died in 1997 at the age of 122. And astonishingly, even though we've had you know, over two decades intervening, there's still no chance of that record being broken anytime soon. I think I might, I might have got this wrong. I might be slightly out of date, but the, the oldest current person is a woman in japan i think she's 116 so oh, she's wow. going to have to make it through the next five years just in order to equal that record and, and like you're saying her risk of death at this point is i mean i don't know yeah it's, it's it astronomical it's, in, it's, <laughs> it's about it's about one in two um there, there's some evidence that there's a plateau of risk of death after you reach the uh, age of maybe 100 or 110 but unfortunately that plateau is very very high it's a 50 50 chance so if you imagine tossing a coin five times she's got to get heads five times in a row right so you know, it's already i think that one in 32 chance of not making it right. even to 120 of making it to 132 the odds are not favorable. the odds are not good exactly and that's assuming that, that's the oldest woman in the world so you know Jean, basically jean Calment's record 120 seems like a reasonable outside limit for human lifespan hmm. given current medical technology and societal trends and so on however i think that when people are trying to make this estimate and trying to call sort of what is the maximum human lifespan the question is what is the maximum human lifespan if you never accumulate senescent cells because they're being removed by these senolytic drugs all the time the answer is we just don't know and it might yeah. be that you know this is all that, 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 that this my ideas are wildly over optimistic and removing the senescent cells doesn't help because something else one of these other hallmarks of aging is sufficiently significant to kill you mm. however I think there's quite good evidence that removing senescent cells actually seems to have a positive effect on the other hallmarks of aging. And so hopefully, 
you know, we're going to see people living longer. Ultimately, I just don't, I, I'm confident that eventually we're going to be biologically immortal. We're going to be ageless. And I think that we should unashamedly aim for that as a species, because it's the way to minimize human suffering. You know, this is just like all medicine. We're trying to cure cancer. We're trying to cure heart disease. Why shouldn't we try and cure aging as well when it causes all of those horrible diseases? So that's definitely where we should be shooting. The question is, how long is it going to take? And, you know, how many missteps are there going to be along the way? And I think it's just worth throwing everything on the kitchen sink at trying just in case it's nearer than we think. Yeah. Well, and so one of the questions that I had um, after reading your book and thinking about this a little bit more is where where is a lot of this research coming from? Is it at the universities? You know, the, well, that's not true. But I was going to say like the not for profit organizations. Is it, um, you know, uh, individual companies that are doing it for profit? These pharmaceuticals, like wh where is a lot of this research coming from? It's a really fascinating um, area and it's a really fascinating sort of contradiction in terms in that there's enough stuff to write what I hope is an interesting book. You know, it's a fact packed book. Um, oh, there's, yeah. enough, there's enough to be genuinely excited about the prospects of this field. We've got dozens of different ways to slow and reverse aging in everything from cells to lab animals, maybe tentatively humans in some of these early human trials. So mm -hmm. there's what feels like a huge amount of science going on. But actually, it's just such a such a small amount. If you look out, at the, you know, take a look at the big picture. Yeah. And the US is actually a great example, a great country to sort of try and understand this in, because the US is one of the few countries in the world that has a research um, organization specifically devoted to understanding aging. And of mm. course, that's a problem in itself. The fact that's almost unique is, you know, suggestive of the fact we're not taking aging seriously enough in most countries in the world, in fact, in all sure. countries in the world. Yeah. So then if we look at the NIA, the National Institute of Aging, which is the US um, sort of organization that covers that, the public funding of aging research. Yeah, There's a running joke in biogerontology, the aging biology circles, that uh, NIA actually stands for National Institute on Alzheimer's Disease. And the reason is that about two thirds of their three and a half billion dollar budget goes on dementia research, which is obviously yeah. very important, but it's not aging. It's not the sort of fundamental thing that causes that dementia, the aging process itself. They also spend money on various other things. The actual aging biology division gets about $350 million a year. Mm. That's a bit more than a dollar per American. So that's not yeah. a huge amount of money when you consider yeah. you know, how much the healthcare system in the US costs more than four trillion. So that's four with 12 zeros after it a year. So that's right. you know already a thousand times more than the NIA budget. It's about 10,000 times more than the aging biology division. And it's actually even worse than that because the aging biology division is primarily focused on understanding aging rather than developing treatments for it. Now, again, it's not to say that's not important work. If we don't understand something, how on earth can we you know, come up Treat with this it, taxonomy, yeah. these hallmarks, and then try and develop treatments? But we need far more effort being put into actually developing those treatments. There are a handful of things that are happening in the sort of biotech and pharma sectors. As I said earlier, there are these 20 or 30 companies trying to turn senolytics into something that can work in the clinic, for example. Um, yeah. there's, there's definitely a sort of growing acknowledgement among investors that there is an opportunity here. I think if you're a canny investor and you get in nice and early, you know, you're a VC and you start investing in some of these early biotechs, some people are going to win very big. But... Mm of the hallmarks of aging, sen uh, these, these senescent cells are the one that is by far the most advanced. There's you know, by far more research, that, uh, more investment that can be made there. There's far more investable stuff. Whereas if you look at something like DNA damage, I think that's going to be one of the toughest hallmarks of aging to solve. And actually mm. we just need, you know, it's not going to be a thousand years more lab research, but we do need a couple of decades of solid, solid work to try and understand how DNA damage accumulates, how mutations accumulate in different cells and what we can do about that stuff. So I think we need much more public funding to get stuff to the point where the private sector can really invest best in earnest. We yeah. also need these changes, like we need the ability to approve a drug for aging, because otherwise pharma companies just aren't that interested in trying to develop yeah. a drug to treat something no that they literally the can't get approval for. So mm -hmm. there are a whole load of sort of cultural shifts that have to happen as well. So it's a really strange place where there's loads of excitement, there's loads of promise, but equally there's just far, far too little money going into it. And I really think that the primary reason I wrote this book, if I, if, if I could have one impact, it would be to increase the amount of funding for aging biology, because yeah. I think it's just under-recognized by the public, by policymakers, even by biologists biologists and doctors, as I said. Um, so if we can just raise the profile of the field, show this is something that's really exciting, something we can do something about, we can just apply, like I said earlier, that same resolve that we brought to COVID, that same amount of money, that same sort of tearing down of regulations where it's safe to do so, then I think we could be in for a pretty exciting couple of decades. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and to, uh, this is something that I was thinking about as well, to dive into conspiracy and sci-fi, um, you know, ha has anyone, is anyone talking about the risks that might come with a large percentage of the population being able to dramatically increase their lifespan. Um, think economic 
you know, environmental, socioeconomic, you know, what sort of things are people concerned about? Hey, if we do figure this out, it actually creates a whole new host of problems that we then have to dive into. The most common question I get when I say I've written a book on aging biology, when I used to go to weddings and dinner parties, if you remember those, uh, those times when that was allowed. I, yeah, vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing, you know, I'd say, oh, hi, I'm Andrew, I'm an author. I, you know, I'm writing a book on aging biology. The first question you get isn't, you know, what's the biological underpinnings? What can I do now? How can I treat it? Blah, blah, blah. It is, yeah. what about overpopulation? Isn't it going to oh, be the case so that, funny. that when that, people, that. you know, are, are suddenly living longer, we're going to have vastly more people on earth. It's going to, you know, crush the environment, et cetera. And the, the, sort of the first answer is people aren't thinking about this enough in the sense that I don't think there's enough research going into understanding what these consequences are going to be, especially when it could happen quite soon. This is something that's important to think about. Right. On the other hand, I think it's less severe than a lot of people immediately think. So mm. to take the overpopulation example, um, if you literally stopped death, you'd add something like 0.75% to global population each year. And that's mm. literally stopping death like now, which is not going to happen because we're still going to have all these you know, uh, car accidents, infections, etc. So that means yeah. you know, there, there are still going to be people dying. And we're not going to cure aging now. It's going to be a sort of gradual process, as I've alluded to. So, you know, even, even if you literally cured death, it only adds a, a surprisingly small amount to global population. Hmm. And actually what that means, you know, the, the, other, the other thing is I, I hate the fact that people call it overpopulation. The reason being, it's not the population that's the problem. It's the resources that we use. And particularly uh, when I say we, those of us in the rich world. So the richest 10% of people use something like half or emit something like half of the carbon dioxide globally. Hmm. And so what that means, and, and the poorest, I think the poorest 50% emit about 7% of the carbon dioxide globally oh, so wow. it's just actually incredible this inequality this disparity and so the way that we're going to get those poorest 50 percent up to our standard of living is we're going to have to come up with a much less carbon intensive way of you know living our lifestyles basically we're going to have to do mm. all the standard stuff decarbonizing our electricity supply decarbonizing all the other things that you know go to make a, a, a fulfill a fulfilling an excellent modern life so this is a problem we're going to have to solve anyway so, uh, sorry, cure, even curing aging, even curing death is only going to make that problem very slightly harder. And then hmm. you've got to look at the sort of other side of the coin here, which is that aging, I, I talk about it in the book as the world's greatest humanitarian challenge, which might sound mm -hmm. weird because it's this sort of natural process. How can it possibly be a humanitarian challenge? Actually, if you look all around the world, not just in the rich countries, but globally, over two thirds of deaths, more than 100,000 people every day die because of aging. They die because of the cancer, the heart disease, the dementia, all these diseases that are primarily affecting people who are, you know, above the age of 60, basically. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that by curing aging, if we could do such a thing, we would be preventing this huge, huge amount of death. But more importantly than that, this huge amount of suffering. Because if you think yeah. about the frailty, uh, you know, the stuff we don't even call diseases, the forgetfulness, the hearing loss, the sight loss. If you think about the, you know, the way that cancer or heart disease kills you, it doesn't just strike you down one night painlessly in your sleep. It can often be years or decades slowly sucking away your independence. So there are literally billions of people suffering because of aging. And if we could cure aging and stop all that, but on the other side of the coin, I'd have to be, you know, 20% more stringent with my carbon dioxide or, you know, take a hit in some other aspect of my lifestyle. I think that'd be totally worth it. And I just think it's, it's honestly a bit immoral to try and argue the opposite way around. If aging didn't exist, we wouldn't invent it to solve climate change. We'd improve, you know, the carbon, we'd, we'd reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that our lifestyles emit. So I really, really think that although these problems do need more understanding, we need to look into them. This is something that could happen, you know, sooner than we think. And therefore policymakers need to start understanding this stuff. Actually, a lot of the consequences when you look into them aren't as severe as they sound at first glance. Hmm. And I understand why aging kind of gets put on the back burner, right? Because it feels like there's all these other big pressing issues hmm. that are right in front of us that we have to deal with. Um, but to your point to kind of, again, ch it changed my perspective. It's like dementia, a lot of these age related diseases, if you can cure aging, these, I'm going to call them symptoms, and I'm sure that's not accurate at all, but all these other things that kind of come with aging, uh, I imagine have to happen at a much smaller degree. Um, if I can, if I can shift gears a little bit, and I know we, we've been going at this for a while here, so maybe this can be one of the last questions I asked you, but I am very interested in the, in the topic of, uh, am I saying this right? Centenarians? Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's one of those words I read and I'm like, ah, I'm going to struggle saying that one. Imagine so, reading the audio book of this. I had to, uh, I, I literally sent a voice memo to a, um, a Korean professor to ask him to, how to pronounce the various names of the Korean eunuch centenarians in that chapter because, uh, and I, ho I hope I didn't butcher them nonetheless. So it's, it's challenging some of these sounded, words. <laughs> sounded good to me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, understanding genetics play a role in this. Uh, when I was 
listening to the part about centenarians and again my, the grandfather who i knew lived to be 100 he almost made it three centuries so what i think hmm. he was born you know 1898 and i feel like he died like 1999 sort of thing so Damn we it. were all really <laughs> we were all and i remember going for his 100th birthday and still being in pretty good health um fair, you know relatively he was he was kind of on his last legs at that point but I shot a note to my mom last night and I was like, hey, I feel like there was a story about his siblings also mm. living a really long time. And sure enough, she got back to me. She was like, oh, yeah, uh, he had two twin sisters. One lived to be 105. <laughs> uh, the other lived to be 99. And then I think there was like a fourth sibling who either died in a war, like died early, but it was yeah. something not age related. Not aging. It was, yeah, it was either a war, or a car crash or something. I should find out. Um, but it was so interesting to me because I think that's one of the things you said in the book. Like if, if someone makes it to 100, the siblings have an exponentially better chance of also living. Um, what are some of the interesting things that have come out of, of storing centen studying centenarians? Um, is it truly just that they have a genetic gift and they're just so much better predisposed to living longer? Like well, what, what's happening there? I think, well, I'm very jealous of your genes is the first thing to say. And um, I've it, convinced it, myself that I've inherited that. So <laughs> yeah, you, I also I mean, have another side of the family who no one's made it past like 70. So well, it, could, so it is, could go one of two this ways. This is an interesting thing because actually um, it's it, the overall genetic contribution to longevity. So the sort of inheritable fraction is very, yeah. very small. Um, hmm. th th there was some, th you, can, you can do these things called twin studies where you look at identical twins who obviously have exactly the same DNA. And then you can look at non-identical twins who have 50% the same DNA because they're just basically you know, brothers and sisters or whatever. And if you try and tease out the differences between how long they each live, it seems that um, longevity is a, about 25% of how long you live is determined by your genes. Hmm. And actually, if you, uh, there was a more recent study that was controlled for a few other things, did it in a slightly different way, came out with an estimate of 5 or 10%, so even smaller than that. So there's a bit of controversy oh, wow. around exactly how you should do the stats, what it really means. But nonetheless, it's a surprisingly small fraction. So if your parents, you know, whether they made it to 60 or 70 or 80, it doesn't really put a ceiling on your longevity. So environment, that, that's encouraging though. Right, because then it's like, look, environment, the things you do that could have, have as effect. large as seventy-five to potentially eighty. So don't forget luck. There's also a huge component oh, yeah. of you know, do you randomly happen to get the wrong combination of mutations through no fault of your own and die in your sixties, and yeah. get, you know, get cancer and die in your sixties? Hmm. But basically, yeah, there's a huge, huge amount that most of us can do in terms of lifestyle. I think if you, um, you know, if you optimize your lifestyle, you can certainly be living years longer than yeah. if you, you know, if you don't bother if you just sit on the couch all day and eat what you want. So. There's, that's that's the sort of the, the optimistic side of that. However, for centenarians, for people who live into their nineties and certainly into their hundreds, there seems to be a much bigger genetic contribution. And that's exactly mm. as you say, because if you're the if you're the sibling or the child of a centenarian, you've got something like a ten times greater chance than someone in the general population of making it to hundred yourself. Hmm. And we don't fully understand the genetics behind it. There are a handful of genes that we think probably contribute towards it, but it's just really, really difficult because th there are just there are twenty thousand genes in a human, so it's very, very hard to pick out you know which ones are causing the effect. Um, so that's 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 one particularly fascinating thing. The other thing is they exactly as you say they tend to get ill later, um, so hmm. they, they they live a, a larger. I think they live about they they get about half as much of their life is not healthy compared to someone in the general population. So that's incredible. It's partly because they live longer, but it's also partly because yeah. they squash that ill health into the very last part of their life. And the other yeah. thing um, that's particularly exciting for you is that um, men are much, much rarer as centenarians. So your great granddad will have, uh, you know, is a much more exciting person to have on your family tree than your two great, great, oh, hang on, how are they connected to you? But his sisters anyway. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Uh, aren't you yeah. something? Because women outnumber men in terms of centenarians about five to one. But what's right. really interesting is that the men who do make it to 100 tend to be quite a lot healthier than the women. Yeah. So um, the women who make it to 100, about 40% of them in one study had a, any one or more of a combination of age-related diseases they were looking at. But only about 20% hmm. of the men had those, one of those diseases and the rest of them were, you know, the eight, other 80% were obviously, as you say, not, not in perfect health. They weren't all springing around like 30-year-olds, but they were nonetheless free of anything that we'd largely call a disease. Hmm. So there's all this really, really fascinating stuff trying to dig through the genes. In terms of lifestyle, the reason it seems that they are just genetically blessed, it's probably not literally just genetic blessing, but there's been some really fascinating work done uh, by a guy called Nir Barzilai in New York. And he studied uh, particularly the Ashkenazi Jewish community there who've got a huge concentration ah, okay. of centenarians. Yeah. And he basically found that if you ask centenarians, do they smoke? Do they how much do they eat? How much exercise do they do? They're about as bad as the rest of us, frankly. You know that they they haven't got particularly healthy body weight. It's not like they're constantly in the gym. 
these people just seem to be protected from all the stuff that kills the rest of us. And so, so I'll, yeah, and I hate to interrupt, but there's one of my favorite stories by my uncle, who I, honestly I should probably have on this podcast because he's a character uh, in himself. Um, but this, the, the, the great grandfather who lived to be 100, I think, smoked for 60 years. Mm. Um, and not only that, like I remember one time my uncle, he just got introduced to the family, was trying to make a nice impression. He's like, hey, I'm going to the store. Can I get you anything? He's like, yeah, grab me a pack of cigarettes. And I think at this point he must have been, I don't know, 70, 80, uh, probably in the 70s. And he came back with a, with a pack of camel lights, <laughs> handed it to my great grandfather, ripped the filter off the cigarette <laughs> and said, I don't need a tampon on my cigarette. And like, that's the kind of guy he was. And he made it to a hundred years old. So it's, you know, he was not this like health enthusiast. Like he was, you know, he was getting after it for a very long time. There's a very um, similar story about Jean Calment, this, the world's oldest woman that I mentioned. Um, she was told not to smoke by her doctor and she outlived her doctor. <laughs> she just, she kept on smoking. And even though he, I think he was probably even younger than her. I can't remember exactly when she stopped, but it was late. You know, she was yeah. smoking re for really quite a substantial fraction of those 122 years. And, you know, most of us would obviously be dead. Smokers live on average 10 years less long and they have 10 years right. less health span. And yet oldest woman in the world smoked for a huge fraction of her life. So there's clearly something going on, isn't there? Incredible. Yeah. Ah, man. Well, um, this is this has been incredibly interesting, and like I said, we only scratched the surface of, of what is in this book. So, um, if you're listening and you enjoyed this, I, I highly recommend it. I'll, I'll make sure to link to it um, for people who would like to follow you, uh, learn more about your current work, and what you continue to do in the future. Where where can I point them? I'm on Twitter. I'm at Stato. I'm on Instagram as Andrew J. Steele. I'm on Facebook as Dr. Andrew Steele. I'm, I've done really well on getting consistent social media handles. As you yeah, can tell. it's I, getting harder every day. <laughs> it really is. I'm also on YouTube as Dr. Andrew Steele. So there's a few videos about the book and I'm hoping to make a few more about not just the science, but also the, some of the ethics stuff that we started to discuss. My next video hopefully is going to be on overpopulation. So oh, yeah, so very any, cool. any of those um, or, or all, if, uh, if that's your, if that's your tickle to fancy. That's perfect. Oh, and if I could ask you this one question, this is something I was really interested in. Um, was there anything related to longevity or age research or, um, you know, uh, approaches that people are trying today that you looked into, but that didn't make it into the book? Any fields of study or things that you're like, ah, almost, but you know what? I don't know if this has a place. The one thing that I couldn't quite place that I can think of off the top of my head um it's and uh, to caveat this my uh, my first draft was 130,000 words long and the book is 100,000 words long my oh, editors wow. did a um did a good job scything i mean most of it was you know justified excessive scientific detail that needed to be got rid of <laughs> um that's just sort of nerd that i am but th the one thing that i really couldn't put anywhere was this idea of um uh, your, your cells and a lot of membranes in your body are made up of these these fatty acids and mm. some people have been looking into what's called deuterating these fa fatty acids so what that means is that uh, hydrogen which is the simplest element on the periodic table most hydrogen has a single proton in its center mm. it's a single proton with a single electron zooming around the outside okay. however there are what are called isotopes of hydrogen all all elements in the periodic table have different isotopes hydrogens are called deuterium du meaning two so that's a proton and a neutron so it's got two things in its nucleus and tritium has got uh, a proton and two neutrons so the commonality of hydrogen is it always has one proton, but you can hmm. have different numbers of neutrons, zero, zero, one or two most commonly. Yeah. And um, scientists sometimes use deuterium just as a sort of label, basically, to, to follow things through the body because it's quite an uncommon form of hydrogen. So if you label a particular compound with what's called deuter you deuterate it, so to speak, then you can yeah. follow it through the body and you know, see what's happening, basically see where it's being used, et cetera, et cetera. But what scientists have found is that by deuterating the fatty acids that are used in these membranes, it seems to make them more stable for some reason. We don't really huh. know why. There's some sort of tempting positive results, but it's very hard to know like where that fits into my taxonomy, these 10 hallmarks. So unfortunately, that was that was one that was left on the cutting room floor that I'm trying to keep an eye on. Ah, okay. Very interesting. Well, good. That, uh, that'll be a great place to start for book number two. Do you have another <laughs> book in the works? Not not or, just yet. I've been absolutely yeah. overwhelmed with the publicity. So it came out in the UK at the end of last year, end of 2020, and in the US in March. And so sort of the tail end of the US publicity is just sort of happening now. And I'm still, as you can hear, going on a few podcasts and that kind of thing. So oh, hoping, yeah. Once the dust settles, I'll have time to sort of regroup and uh, you know <laughs> plan what the future's got in store. Absolutely. Well, perfect. Well, again, thank you. This was awesome. Um, and if you haven't read the book, folks, read it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much.